Israel threatens to annex parts of the occupied West Bank, will Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu follow through on his controversial plan? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. Israel's push to annex as much as 30% of occupied Palestinian territories is facing international resistance. European and Arab leaders condemn the plan, a move considered illegal by the United Nations. Prime Minister Netanyahu, meanwhile, is facing headwinds of his own, from a growing coronavirus outbreak to record unemployment and anti-government protests. There is growing speculation annexation could take weeks or even months. To discuss all of this, I want to turn to Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, member of the PLO Executive Committee. She joins us from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Dr. Ashrawi, thanks for being with us. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Anna. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has threatened to annex parts of the West Bank to extend Israeli sovereignty to these areas. He wanted to do that by July 1st. Well, that date has come and it's passed, but that plan is still on the table. What is your reading of the situation right now? Well, he kept protesting and he kept promising and threatening that he's going to annex over 30% of the West Bank. But what he actually is doing is keeping annexation. It's a, a cumulative process, a continuum, if you will, of land theft, of confiscation, of appropriation, and of uh, annexation. What he's threatening to do is to extend, as he said, Israeli law on the West Bank. Uh, but the settlers, the illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank, also are subject to Israeli law. They are not subject to the law of the land, even though they're living on occupied Palestinian territory, illegally there, in Jewish-only settlements. So uh, it's, it's not something that is a sudden, you know, uh, a massive explosion. It's something that has been happening. If you remember, in 1980, they passed a law in order to annex uh, East Jerusalem, and in 1981, they annexed the Golan Heights. We didn't see this massive outcry or pushback or even uh, an exercise of accountability like sanctions on Israel. Now he, he keeps protesting he's going to do it, and at the same time, he's doing it de facto in, in a systematic manner of superimposing greater Israel on all of Palestine. Right. You have said that the Israeli plan would be, to quote you, an acid test of the global rule of law. Uh, explain that to us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there is such a culture emerging which is extremely toxic. It's been in Israel for a long time, a total disdain for international law, a total disdain and contempt for human rights and rights of other people, a purely racist system, a system that uh, excludes others and treats uh, uh, a certain group of people with uh, privilege and benefits and so on. So this kind of racist uh, exclusionary system in Israel is now resonating in the U.S. You have the Trump administration, you have Bolsonaro <laughs> uh, in Brazil, you have others, you have uh, uh, Orban in, in Hungary, you have this mentality of superiority, entitlement, dismissal, and a violation of the law. Now, this we see as an attack, as a direct frontal attack on the global rule of law. It's an attack on the multilateral system that was created after the Second World War. It's an attack on a rules-based rules order that is supposed to protect the vulnerable and the weak and hold the uh, powerful accountable and hold the, the exercise of absolute brute power and force in check. Now, the fact that Israel has been doing this systematically without any kind of consequence, accountability, without any kind of protection for the Palestinians has really dealt a blow to the credibility and standing of the multilateral system, which is already under attack. Now that there is this mentality again of populism and lawlessness and racism, it's very clear that if the uh, international community uh, does not take active steps and does not take measures of accountability to send a clear message that there, there are consequences to violations of international law, to a systematic and systemic uh, violation of human rights, to land theft, to committing uh, war crimes, 
such as settlements with full impunity, if they do not send a message, then they certainly will create, uh, will resonate with, with the people like and with systems like uh, the Trump administration or Bolsonaro or others, and will tell the rest of the world that the strong can do whatever it wants, while the weak have to bear the consequences without any kind of curbs or any kind of protection. So that's why we're saying now the Palestinian question has been uh, on the table, so to speak, of the international community, of the multilateral system, ever since Israel was created. And it was created on Palestinian land. And it kept expanding and annexing and expanding. And now it is attempting to destroy what the international community says is the consensus, the two-state solution which is no longer possible because Israel is, bu is busy stealing the land of the Palestinian state. Now this is the test. Now that Israel right. is destroying, right. has destroyed this two-state solution, which is supposedly the legal or the uh, global solution, then uh, what do they propose to do? Do they tell us to come up with something new? <laughs> or do they tell Israel that there are consequences? Right. Or do they come up with something new that is consistent international law. Yeah, speaking of consequences, the European Union, uh, as well as some Arab states, say that they are opposed to this plan. In fact, the French foreign minister said that there would be, in his words, consequences. He didn't specify what those consequences would be, but he said there would be consequences uh, for the relationship between the EU and Israel. Um, do you believe that Israel will face some kind of censure from the EU? How effective would that be? Well, Israel might. I mean, look, the, the EU apologetically or hesitantly even uh, adopted the, uh, the law uh, that uh, said that they will label Israeli settlements and that they will not, uh, they will label them so that the consumers will know what they're buying, mm -hmm. which is not something great and it's not something outrageous. It's the right of the consumer or the investor to know what he or she is buying or investing in. But even that was not uh, implemented or applied. So the EU has been known for uh, lots of uh, declarations and statements and condemnations and so on, but without translating this position into concrete actions and steps. Now that they're saying there will be consequences, they're telling Israel, if you go ahead and annex, there will be consequences. We're saying Israel has already annexed. Israel has already stolen our land and resources. Israel has already built uh, more than 150 settlements in the West Bank. It has already brought in over 650,000 illegal settlers right. into our territory. Right. So what do you propose to do? Either you take steps or you're satisfied just uh, making statements. And Israel says always, you can say what you want, provided we do what we want. And this has been the name of the game. Now. They're sort of raising the, the level, let's say, the volume a bit, and saying there will be consequences, but they still haven't spelled out what these consequences are. Eleven foreign ministers of European countries, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, asked the EU to come up with clear statements as to what these consequences are. Yeah. And we still yeah. don't know. So the thing is, without knowing that there are concrete steps to be taken, Israel will continue to act with full impunity, totally protected from the force of the law, totally protected from any kind of accountability, and the Palestinians will continue to pay the price. This, again, is a test for the will and the determination and the courage of the European Union. You know, you said a moment ago that a two-state solution is no longer possible. Well, there's quite a vigorous and robust debate going on here in the United States over the viability of a two-state solution. Uh, there was an, as you pointed out, there are now 650,000 settlers in the occupied West Bank. There's a prominent and very influential journalist here in the United States, uh, Peter Baynard, who wrote a piece. Uh, he's the editor at large of Jewish Currents magazine. He wrote a piece in which he says, the two-state solution is effectively dead, and it's time to talk about one state, some kind of binational state or a confederation of some kind. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it's about time that this argument comes out in the open, particularly in the Jewish community, in the U.S., in Israel, everywhere, because, uh, I mean, expressing loyalty to Israel, right or wrong, makes you complicit in many ways. And uh, enabling Israel to continue and pursue its plans of destroying 
the possibility of any Palestinian, uh, sovereign Palestinian state means that you have allowed Israel to go so far as to do that. So now, <coughs> sorry, so now Peter is saying that, well, uh, since Israel is insistent, or the, the Israeli government is insistent on destroying the two-state solution, we have to come to grips with the idea of uh, not a Jewish state per se, but a safe Jewish community, which means that it's not uh, a question of sovereignty and, and the statehood and so on as a nation state, but one in which you can live in peace and harmony with others in one state in Palestine, in historical Palestine, since this is what's been happening gradually by Israel. Now, whether he will have takers, whether they will see that, that there is a need to treat all people are equal, as you know, the moment you say Palestinians have equal rights, people say you're anti-Semitic. Or if you say Palestinians need to be treated fairly, they say, well, you are anti-Israel. Yeah. No, the question is whether all people are treated equal. We as Palestinians have even accepted the, the establishment of the State of Israel on our land. We agreed to share the land. Israel is the one who is not only disagreeing, but who is trying to take to steal the whole land, all of historical Palestine. So now the deal is up, probably. Right. You have to right. have new configurations, as they say, and it has to be done with a thoughtful political plan which will have subscribers and take them. If this annexation plan goes ahead, uh, Dr. Ashrawi, I mean, where does that leave the Palestinians? What options do you have? Uh, the Palestinian president, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, has said that he's willing to resume negotiations with the Israelis. Um, is that realistic? What will they be discussing? <laughs> exactly. I don't think you can resume any negotiation. I don't think you can have any negotiations with Israel as things stand, because Israel and the U.S. have decided that annexation is not illegal. They have decided that land theft is something that Israel can do unilaterally. They have decided that the U.S. will extend support and protection for Israel to continue that. And if the American uh, ambassador in, in uh, Israel is, is uh, actually pushing for annexation before elections, because he's worried that Israel might not do this should the Trump lose elections and so on. So in, in, uh, in many ways, I think it's important that you understand that negotiations are not an objective. They are a means to an end. And so far they have failed because Israel used the negotiations as a way of creating cuts unilaterally, as a way of expanding, as a way of exercising control illegally, military control, and illegal sovereignty over the West Bank, creating what Yeshdin uh, uh, called uh, uh, now clearly an apartheid system in the West Bank, where you are importing illegal settlers, you are giving them benefits and privileges, and so on, and you are treating the indigenous population with absolute brutality and oppression. So now what are the Palestinian options? Of course, we're not going to negotiate. There's nothing to negotiate about. The, the Trump plan is a, a deal of surrender. Either the Palestinians, you know, surrender and abrogate their rights and succumb to the power and the oppression of the Israelis, or they will continue to be bashed into submission or punished for not uh, uh, surrendering or uh, accepting defeat, as Jared Kushner said. The Palestinian people are not defeated. And we have recourse to the international law, and we will continue to do that. We will go to the International Criminal Court, as we have done. Israel and Israeli decision makers complicit in the war crimes have to be held accountable. We will continue to go to the UN. We, we have now a rising public opinion in the US and elsewhere that is beginning to see the danger and the horror and the cruelty right, no, of this time. As you point out, uh, there is uh, a rapidly closing window of opportunity for Israel because we have the election coming up in uh, November. Um, the polls at the moment show that the uh, candidate likely to take on President Trump in November, Joe Biden, would win the election if it were held right now. Uh, and if he does become president, um, do you believe that there would be a better chance of some kind of resolution to this very long-running dispute and conflict? 
I think if the Trump administration is no longer in power, then you will see a decrease in, in contempt for international law, a decrease in sort of mindless brutality, a decrease in pandering to the you know, extreme uh, fundamentalist evangelical Zionist evangelicals who want to give everything to Israel. Uh, that is, is one thing we need to see. But we are also seeing that within the Democratic Party, there are voices, there are progressive voices, there are people who are challenging the mainstream Democrats even, and who are saying Palestine should be on the agenda, and the way you treat Palestine is important. I think Bernie Sanders, in many ways, broke the taboos and, and opened up windows for a candid discourse on Palestine, which was not there before, because we were totally dismissed and Israel was totally embraced. Now, there are many within the Biden camp who still want to embrace Israel. There are many who still shout out to, to the pro-Israel lobby, including AIPAC and so on. But uh, there are those who are now beginning to question this and to say that, no, it's, it's we, the, the U.S. has to play uh, a role that is consistent with the values of uh, international law and, and human rights and so on, rather than uh, constantly uh, do what Israel wants, which has been the case all along. Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, thanks so much for joining us. You're most welcome. Thank you. I want to continue the discussion with our panel. Joining me from Jerusalem, Jeremy Salton is a Knesset insider and political analyst. Also from Jerusalem, Tammy Molad heo is a journalist and activist. Welcome to both of you to the show. Jeremy, let me start with you. You just heard that interview there with Dr. Hanan Ashrawi, the Palestinian leader. I mean, she made the point that a two-state solution now is impossible, that Israel is breaking the law. It's a violation of uh, international law. And she also made the point that what uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is now trying to do with annexation is basically putting a legal imprint on a situation that already exists. What's your response to that? Well, uh, you know, the question really is, why is Israel doing it and why is Israel choosing now? And really it comes down to three main reasons. The first is that we do believe this will increase the security of our country. And when it comes to Israel, security is one of the most central aspects of concern. The second is that there are hundreds of thousands of citizens that live over what is called the Green Line. And obviously, they are a huge constituency within the right. And there's an expectation of Netanyahu to go ahead and do something for these citizens. And the third is that this is part of an American plan. This isn't an Israeli plan. This is an American plan that is thinking outside of the box, trying to escape a lot of the old paradigms and bring about peace by trying something that goes beyond what we've seen in the past, which is the recipe of trying to ask the Israelis to give more than the maximum that they can give while trying to go ahead and deal with the situation of the Palestinians needing to perhaps accept less than the minimum that they've been willing to accept in the past. All right. Tammy, what do you make of the annexation plan and uh, Jeremy's contention that this is about security and this is not actually an Israeli plan, it's an American plan? Well, I don't know about, about America's plans around, uh, in this region, but for sure it's not a security plan, it's a political plan. It was, it was, uh, it was born out of, the, of, out of political necessity for Netanyahu. And since he has bigger issues and bigger problems uh, on his plate right now, the annexation is no longer on the table. We have to say that. It's no longer on the table. It was supposed to happen at the 1st of July. It, 1st of July came and went. And nothing is going to happen in the next few months. Israel is in, uh, in, in turmoil right now because of COVID-19, because of the economics, because of unemployment. and. All the, 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 the rest of the political issues, such as annexation, which has no bearing whatsoever on Israeli security, not really, are just going to have to wait. Jeremy, what do you make of that, that this has nothing to do with security? Um, and, you know, the fact that this is essentially about domestic Israeli politics. Well, <laughs> again, it's uh, Tammy's right to disagree with me, but if you're asking the people who are moving this plan forward, they're talking about security. 
if you're looking at the reasons that the Americans say that it makes sense for the Israelis to apply Israeli sovereignty in specifically these areas, it's specifically because these are areas that are needed for Israel's secure borders. Now, uh, you know, I understand that Tommy's talking about political concerns, but there, there is something here which is a movement that's been going on for many years that has been pushing for this issue, and this is now a movement that has gotten American acceptance. It's true that we're past July 1st, but just yesterday, Lahav Harkov of the Jerusalem Post said that the Americans are still discussing this. This is not off the table. July 1st was not a magical date. This was a date that was chosen by the alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz in the coalition agreement. The Americans never mentioned July 1st. Benjamin Netanyahu never mentioned July 1st. That has strictly been used by Benny Gantz and Gabi Ashkenazi, who are not the senior members of this government. Tammy, uh, if this plan goes ahead, or if it doesn't go ahead, if it doesn't become law in the Israeli Knesset, uh, what then happens to the two-state solution? Do you believe, like Hanan Ashrawi says, that that is now impossible? Uh, no, I don't think it's impossible, but I think that the window, uh, the, the window is closing. The, we, we, we have to do something now, and we have to remember that at the end of the day, Palestinians and Israelis live in this region, not the Americans. The, the, America might have a, a strategic uh, uh, input in, in what's going on, and they have been great friends for Israel, and they have been good friends for the Palestinians for times, too. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's up to the both of us. Israelis and Palestinians have to sit and solve this problem. Because, you know, at the, if, if I look at the, at the recent hist history of dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians, I have a lot of complaints towards Israeli, Israeli governments, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's always the Palestinians who are, who are disagreeing, always, uh, time after time. It's, it's as if they, are, they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Now they're saying a two-state solution is not possible, but in, in a few years they will say a one-state solution is not possible. They, they, it's, it seems as if they don't really know what they want, because it's... It's as if they have gotten used to the situation as it is, but neither, neither one of the people can continue in this situation. A right. two-state solution is still a viable solution as long as we, as, as we do something now. Well, the Palestinians say that, and some, uh, as I pointed out, a prominent journalist here in the United States, Peter Bernard, said that as well, that a two-state solution is not possible anymore. Uh, saying that because there are 650,000 Israelis living in the occupied territories, that's one, and two, you have a prime minister who wants to formally annex part of those territories. Uh, that's true, but this prime minister, uh, yeah, he might be, he might be uh, counting his days, uh, his days now as prime minister. Uh, just to remind all of us that uh, next week he has his first court date. Uh, plus, uh, again, as I said, it's, it's, even if there are so many, so many Israelis living in, 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 the, in the West Bank, if we're talking about peace and there is a Palestinian state, there shouldn't be any problem with a few Israeli or Jewish settlements there, as long as they live according to the, to the, 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 the rule of the land. The same can be about uh, Palestinian settlements within the Israeli territory. The line, where the line uh, exactly passes, that's not written in stone. This is something that we can decide upon on, with, with, with a real, honest dialogue. There is a solution as long as people will want to, to agree. As, long, uh, as, far as, as far as I see, nobody wants to sit at the table and, and have any kind of dialogue. Jeremy, as Tammy says, you know, uh, she supports a dialogue which implies two sides talking, but if we look at this annexation plan, it is a unilateral plan. It is one side imposing its will on another side. Well, this is a response to Palestinian unilateral moves. It was the decision of the Palestinians to go to the ICC. It was the decision of the Palestinians to go ahead and to already start joining UN bodies. They were the first ones to go ahead and break the Oslo Accords. But suddenly, when Israel takes unilateral moves, they're being called out on it. It would have been nice if we would have seen when the Palestinians were taking unilateral moves, the international community to come in and speak out about that. But really, on a point that, that was brought up uh, beforehand, I do think that there needs to be an understanding of why it is that the Palestinians are not seeing any traction. Because what we heard here from your guest was that she was trying to say 
Israelis need to get a message that the international community does not accept it. But today, the diplomatic standing of Israel is the best it's ever been. We have relations with a lot of the Arab and Muslim uh, nations that we did not have with before. We have a big block of nations within the European Union who are solidly pro-Israel and are going ahead and stopping a lot of the things that you had mentioned that the French or perhaps uh, those in Luxembourg are trying to go ahead and push through. The Palestinians, uh, to, to go ahead and echo Tammy, do not have a clear strategy. It seems like they're just throwing everything against the wall like spaghetti to see what's going to stick. Right. Jeremy, they, all the Europeans, though, we had, as I pointed out, the French foreign minister who was saying that there will be consequences if Israel goes ahead with this. Yes, uh, I, I do believe that there will be a souring of relations with uh, a handful of countries. But let's look back at history. Israel has applied Israeli sovereignty both to eastern Jerusalem as well as to the Golan Heights. What we've seen time and time again is that you have a short period of time where it's a little bit difficult, but then as the years go on, de facto, what ends up happening is, is that people end up recognizing it. This American administration recognized both applications of Israeli sovereignty, and now they're looking to even extend that. In the same floor of the building I'm in now, you have the Guatemalan embassy here in Jerusalem. So th there is a uh, movement here where things have stopped going in the direction of the Palestinians and they're now going in the direction of the Israelis. And this comes, as Tammy said, because the Palestinians continue to refuse every deal that's put in front of them. What I will say to you know the two-state uh, solution question and its viability is that if beforehand they could have had 100% of the territory and then 95 and then 90%, Trump is offering them 70%. If they say no, whether they like it or not, this might be their last opportunity to have one. Because, yes, there are facts on the ground that are being made, and it's going to be more and more difficult for them. But they're going to just keep saying no. I'll tell you one last thing on this. Yeah. If Mahmoud Abbas mm -hmm. tells Donald Trump that he's willing to sit with him and deal and have a negotiation, I am sure that the annexation will be taken off the table. This is what's happening. The Palestinians will not engage with the Americans, so the Americans are engaging with those who will talk to them. All right. Uh, Tammy, uh, speaking about what the Palestinians want to do, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, has said that he's willing to open negotiations with the Israelis, but this annexation plan has to be off the table. Isn't that an opening? Um, it, it, it could be an opening. I'm just not sure that he really means it, because up till now, the, he, he wasn't really ready to sit at the table. But I have to say something about what Jeremy just said. Mm -hmm. Trump is willing to give up 70 percent of, of, of the lands. This is not Trump's land. This is not America's land. This is Israel and Palestine, Israelis and Palestinians land and it's for us to decide and it's for us to divide. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, that suddenly the, the, the extreme right in Israel and the extreme uh, left in Israel, the same by the way with the Palestinians, are looking at others, at other countries as if they will solve our problems. Well, if we want to have countries here that, that will be viable and that will be able to give the citizens what they need, then we have to start owning the reality and owning the decisions. No one can give anyone anything except us. It is up, up to us, Israelis and Palestinians. If, if Mahmoud Abbas is serious and he really wants to sit at the table, then, well, uh, I hope that there, that, that there are people in the Israeli government who will be willing to sit with him. I suspect that it won't be easy, but I have to say that uh, I don't fully trust his, uh, this declaration of, him, of his. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Tammy Millard Hale and Jeremy Salton, thanks to both of you for joining us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, 
The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.